Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so, continuing literally where we left off uh, before uh, tea break. Um, so, one of the reasons uh, that a lot of uh, revived excitement is there in the reinforcement learning community and also in other communities who have never taken reinforcement learning very seriously before uh, is this uh, big success in uh, game playing, you know, in arcade, uh, arcade games. Right? So, I am pretty sure people have seen many of these Atari games, Space Invaders, Pong, Breakout, Sequest, yes? Right. So, uh, so this uh, company called DeepMind uh, set up this uh, Q learning agent. Okay, it did nothing more clever than that. Set up a Q learning agent that took the video screen as an input. You know, the pixels on the screen as an input. Okay, and uh, as output produced commands, joystick commands: go left, go right, up, down. Then also press the button, joystick button. Right, it produced those commands with joystick buttons essentially like fire right and uh, learn to play games from scratch right which is like think stop and think about it it's amazing no visual processing went in right they just learned from raw pixels fed as input right and it learned to give actual control signals as output and it learned to play games it was not told what the objective of the game was in the beginning um, just just gets gets a reward based on uh, based on the game state you know and uh, they used a very complex neural network right they used a convolutional network and then uh, they trained it using q learning okay they did none of the more fancy stuff that the deep learning people do they trained it using just q learning and used uh, a gradient uh, descent for training it right and it's in fact uh, according to some accounts considered one of the hardest ai problems not just learning problems one of the hardest ai problems that people have solved so far, but more importantly for uh, the research community, right. So, we, we looked at certain large examples earlier, we looked at helicopter control, we looked at backgammon, we looked at go and other things which looked at very large state spaces and solved the problems, but they are one off, right. There is no, no team other than those derived from Andrew Ings group which can make a helicopter fly, because it requires significant amount of uh, infrastructure to come to the point where you can do that. Right and backgammon the the 190 odd features that Jerry Tesoro used are kind of proprietary, right? So you can't reproduce those results, really, right? And uh, so what is nice about this thing is that DeepMind, which uh, subsequently was bought by Google, has actually released the code that they use for playing this game, learning to play this game, and you can reproduce the result. Okay, so that is what is amazing about it. So here are some videos of this learning to play the game right this is uh, pong so when it starts it's pretty bad right and as as time progresses it starts learning slightly better right so whenever it misses a ball it gets a minus 1 right and so it starts playing slightly better right i have a cheat sheet here as to how to forward these things see anything here. So, now it is really learnt well. In fact, it tries more, it more often than not wins without conceding a single point or maybe one point or something like that. Right? It, it becomes really good and it is learning from scratch. Now, they took the same network. Right. They took the same network, right? Of course, it is untrained, okay, from scratch again. They made it play breakout. So, it is the same, you are supposed to know breakout is supposed to bounce the ball, and so like this, they have trained it on uh, uh, something like uh, right now, I think they, they, they can play something like 42 out of the 50 Atari games that are available in the simulator. Of course, they have to retrain everything, it is not, it's not like one network that you just take it and put it in another game it will play that game. So, they have to train from scratch, but the thing is 
they don't have to tune parameters, they are not changing any of the number of neurons in the layers and stuff like that. It is the same architecture, the neural network architecture that can learn all of these games. Yeah, so we are doing some work on that, there is really nothing much out there in the community. So for example, one of the things which we found out was uh, when you play, when you train the network on uh, breakout, right. So in the convolutional networks, the general wisdom is that they are learning filters to process the input, right. So you take the filters you learn in convolutional net, uh, in the breakout and you rotate it by 90 degrees and you use it in uh, Pong, it seems to work, right. It works better than learning Pong from scratch, so there is some useful information that is being transferred. But then it's, these are anecdotal, right. I can say oh, so Pong and breakout look similar to me and therefore, well, so is there a more systematic way that you can define of uh, what are similar games, when would transfer between games work and so on and so forth, that is an open question. So it is still a uh, lot of work that needs to be done in that. So, uh, but uh, so if you are interested in transfer in the general deep learning setting, there is some uh, quite a bit of work there, uh, but in the deep learning and uh, deep RL kind of a setting. There is really not very little out there, um, yeah, but interesting. So here is another game which is essentially the C quest and uh, should probably, I can not see anything on my screen. Somewhere about here, yeah. so it has learnt really well now, okay. And the amazing thing is it is the same network, okay. And what is really nice about these videos? is that these were not produced by DeepMind, okay. This come from a blog, some independent uh, set of uh, researchers have actually reproduced the results from DeepMind using the code that was released by them and the same set of parameters that they released. They have trained it. So this is not just the one off arbitrary success by DeepMind. So I mean DeepMind also has released some of those videos which are, which are really cool, but this is from a blog from an independent party. And I can also vouch that even my students have managed to reproduce uh, the similar kind of results using the code uh, released by Google, right. So now the grand challenge is how do you make this work for other problems, right, which uh, has not had the benefit of significant amount of optimization done on it, right. So that is something which left. So here are some references for some of the stuff I spoke about and uh, right. So this is the standard uh, RL textbook, uh, reinforcement learning and introduction. And it is also available freely online, so Rich and Andy are working on a second edition and the current work in progress, whatever is the current state of the second edition that is also available online, okay. So, so you can go to Rich Sutton's home page and you can pick it up from there. So these are more standard uh, textbooks, AI and machine learning textbooks which have small sections on reinforcement learning if anyone wants to read up. And this is a more uh, technical uh, introduction to reinforcement learning, uh, so neurodynamic programming by uh, Bersikas and Sitsiklis. And if you are interested in some of the neuroscience aspects of it, uh, so Diane and Abbott uh, is a very good, uh, it is it's a very huge tome on theoretical neuroscience, but it has a whole chapter on uh, reinforcement learning models in neuroscience. So if you are interested in that aspect of it, so these are good uh, books to look at, okay. Uh, any questions on, great. So now I am to go to my So this is what I should have started at 4 o'clock. Um, so scaling up, so there are many approaches to scaling that people have been looking at in the literature. I mean that is the, the uh, main theme of research in RL for the last decade or so, okay. So it is just so much work out there, I really cannot hope to do justice if I try to cover those. Uh, so what I am going to do is essentially talk a little bit about using parameterized representation, okay and talk a little bit more about using hierarchies because that is something that is close to uh, my heart and it is what I do a lot of. And then um, yeah, questions later, right. Um, so the two, I would classify approaches to scaling in two, two main uh, subdivisions. One is using parameterized representations. We have been talking about many functions that we have to maintain, right. So we have to maintain a value function, right. We have to maintain a representation for a policy. Quite often we do not maintain an explicit representation for the policy, we just take the value function when we act greedily with respect to the value function we get our policy, right. But uh, in other, other instances we might want to represent the policy explicitly, 
because it is easier than trying to be greedy with respect to a arbitrarily defined value function every time right and uh, therefore, you might want to directly work with policies. So, in which case so all of these require some kind of representation. So, far we have been talking about uh, these being represented as lookup tables you know for every state I have a value right for every state I have an action given by the policy, but it could also want to represent these by uh, some kind of parameterized functions ok and that allows you now you are not limited by the memory size or anything you can actually look at very very large state spaces and additionally you get another advantage right. So, you get your generalization right. So, that is the whole thing with uh, uh, all the supervised learning parameterized function representations that you have been talking about so far right. So, you get generalization. So, you also can know something about states you have never visited just because they happen to have the same parameterization as states that you have already seen right and assuming that you have a good parameterization then this allows you to have very nice generalization even to unseen parts of the state space ok. So, so that is that is one thing which people do and the other one which I am going to call as hierarchical decomposition is essentially to try and take a very complex uh, policy representation or a very complex problem de uh, definition and break it up into smaller parts ok and then you solve these smaller parts individually right and then you learn to try and put them back together. So, I will expand on this little bit more in the subsequent slides, but this allows you to at every point of time solve a small problem right. You take a very complex problem and then you break it out into smaller parts. So, each part you solve separately and then when you put them together you do not have to worry about the solution details of the smaller parts you just have to stitch them together at the higher level and there again you can be paying attention to a much smaller problem. So, at every every stage you can look at small problems and you can solve it. So, one way of thinking about it is that you are kind of layering your learning. So, I mentioned this in the robo soccer example earlier. So, at each level you learn uh, to solve different problems and then uh, you can scale to larger problems right. So, in value function approximation so I am going to say that since you have all been looking up looking at uh, regression and other things in gory detail. So, I thought I can compress these slides a little bit right it is fine right all of you know about linear regression. Great. So, what we do in uh, value function approximation. Uh, so, if you remember I said you can approximate value functions or you can parameterize policies ok. I am not going to talk too much about models I will just have a very brief note on that, but you could do value functions or policies. So, essentially what you do is that you use some kind of uh, linear parameterization. So, I am going to say v hat is the parameterized representation for the, 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 the approximation for the policy right and w is the set of uh, weights that I have to learn and phi of s is some function of the state ok that gives me a set of features right that I am going to use. So, in backgammon that phi of s could return me that 192 component vector that I was talking about right or in uh, in the Atari games phi of s could be the output of the convolutional neural network right it could be very complex I did not say phi has to be simple ok I am saying what you do after you get phi is simple it is linear. So, phi can be pretty complex right. So, you can put in a lot of things into phi. Phi could be as something as simple as the x and y coordinates of your grid world right, but typically if you are looking to solve large problems you end up putting in a lot of complexity into the phi right. So, now the question natural question is where does phi come from and that is the problem of AI ok. That is that is something that is a question that uh, is uh, been the fundamental question that uh, artificial intelligence researchers have been trying to answer from the 50s. So, do not expect me to give an easy answer, uh, but uh, given all the hoopla right now a fee comes from your deep neural network <laughs> ok. <laughs> you should come to NIPS, <laughs> but you were at NIPS last time uh, half of NIPS was doing deep RL. I mean that is just how it looked like. So, anyway so it is that is really a lot of hoopla about uh, deep RL I am not kidding. So, if you are looking to get employed or looking for good uh, PhD admissions elsewhere right note anyway. So, this is essentially uh, so this is my linearly squares right. So, I am updating my weight uh, looking at the error in the prediction right. So, v pi of s is what I am. So, whenever I write v we are more or less in the in the prediction domain right. So, when I am looking at control I will write q when I am looking at prediction I will be using v right. So, uh, so v pi is what I am trying to approximate right 
and we had this my current approximation. So, that is basically my error right and I am minimizing the squared error and uh, blah. So, I will get that right, but what is the main problem here? I do not know my target right. So, the whole thing with reinforcement learning is nobody is sitting there and giving you the targets right. I do not know what v pi is. If I know what v pi is then my problem is well solved right. Oh you can come and argue say no no. So, I will for some select states I will tell you what v pi is right and now using those uh, the knowledge of v pi in those select states you now generalize to the rest of the world right rest of the state space that is the normal uh, regression problem right I can give you the target values. But again you cannot compute the target values independently for some arbitrary v uh, some arbitrary states yes right. So, you really have to solve for the entire uh, problem domain for you to find out what an estimate of good estimate of v pi is. So, how where are you going to get the targets from right. So, there are several answers to this. So, if you think about it what is v pi? v pi is the expected return starting from state s and following policy pi right. So, what I could potentially do is pick out certain states ok, just run trajectories from those states using my pi and assuming it will end at some time t right. Then as and when these trajectories end I can take the entire return I accumulate over the trajectory I do not have to estimate any values along the way I just take the full return take an average of those returns and say this is my target v pi right. There is a different way of estimating what my v pi should be. So, for individual states along the way I can just estimate what the value function would be and then for those states I can plug it in here and then assume that I will get the generalization to the rest of the state space right. So, this will actually work because the targets that I am giving right uh, are unbiased estimates of what v pi should be right. So, v pi is actually a random variable in some sense right. Uh, so, but I am giving you unbiased estimate of what that random variable is and so, I can use that as the target in this and it will work ok. But then it requires a lot of work lot of work I mean you have to generate lot of samples from each of the states each of those uh, uh, yeah I mean if you want a large enough sample you will have to do this and uh, suppose you are changing your policy again everything goes for a toss. So, what people have done is instead of trying to find uh, any kind of unbiased estimate for v pi they just use the T d target. So, what is the T d target is R t plus 1 plus ouch there should be a gamma there I apologize R t plus 1 plus gamma times we had S t plus 1. Yeah, that is the T d target if you remember that is what we were using as our predict for finding the prediction error when we did the T d 0 update right. So, essentially they take the same thing and plug that in as the target for as an estimate for what v pi should be ok. Now, you can see where the problem is going to come in right because I am using v hat as my target for estimating v hat right. So, it is essentially whenever I change my w my v hat also changes right. So, the next time I come to the same state s yes, and try to make an update I will have a different target. So, my problem has become a non stationary problem my policy pi is fixed the dynamics of my world is fixed right my, 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 my transition matrix p is not changing my expectation is not changing the rewards are not changing my policy is not changing, but I still have a non stationary problem. So, will it work? Surprisingly enough, it turns out it works. Okay, and uh, so here is a here is a whole set of equations that you have to use. Uh, so your delta t is your uh, t d error. If you remember, so this is my t d target, and that is my current estimate. So the difference is the t d error. So on the gradient of this expression that we had, basically reduces to delta t times phi of s t, right? And then uh, my weight update becomes this, right? So it's, it's fairly simple thing. So, this is linear T d 0 algorithm right and uh, I am not getting into the uh, the proof of this, uh, but the thing is uh, so there are a couple of conditions under so, so under which this will converge to uh, a value function 
that is close to the true RMSE minimizer of the value function. So, if I had v pi here, right, if I had the true v pi here, right, and I minimize the mean squared error, right, and given my parameterization, I can approach that true v pi to some distance, right. So, I will have some error. So, given the true param given the parameterization, I can get some, 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 some distance delta close to the, the v pi. Right. The delta could be pretty large depending on how bad my uh, parameterization is. So, what we can show is that linear T d 0 uh, will converge to a point that is close to the true uh, the minimizer to the of the true value function. Okay. Even though I am actually using this uh, moving estimate of what the value function should be. Okay. Okay. So, so that is a nice thing to know. So, the couple of uh, conditions for that. So, one thing is uh, I should visit enough number of states, right, so that I get a good estimate that we already always have a problem with that. And uh, the second thing is that my phi s t, right, uh, well, the initial results required that phi s t should be uh, linearly independent, the feature set that you get should be linearly independent, but now people have relaxed that assumption as well. Uh, the other thing is alpha should decay over time. So, the so alpha t should decay over time otherwise I do not get convergence I will always be changing my uh, parameters. So, that is the thing and uh, so it is a pretty strong result for linear uh, function approximation, uh, but uh, no such strong results uh, exist for other complex representations right. So, even uh, um, you know well other well understood uh, function approximators we do not have any results about convergence strong results about convergence, but there are many many successful examples we already saw two. T D gamma uses a neural network, right? And the Atari game, the deep uh, Q net, it's called the, they call it DQN, the deep Q network. Okay, so DQN is just uses a much more complex neural network than uh, Jerry Tesaro did, and all of this seem to work, right? If you go by theory, okay, none of these are supposed to converge. So, so obviously, there's some more work that needs to be done to understand what is going on, uh, but. Uh, it is interesting. So, I am I am just going to talk about linear T d 0. So, I am not really getting into the details of the algorithm because you guys have done enough of regression uh, already. So, only only thing is you have to be aware of what is what is the target that you are trying to regress to. Okay. So, the other approach people take to scaling which is not really new it has been around for at least 20 years now uh, or uh, policy search methods. So, why did people start looking at policy search methods? Um, quite often it turns out that policies have a much simpler description than value functions. So, one uh, classical example people give is in the problem of inventory control. Right? So, inventory control is a problem. So, I have a many many different items in my in my warehouse. I have to decide um, when to place an order for new items and of which item should I place an order. Right. It turns out that the, the policy itself is, is a very simple threshold policy. If item x falls below threshold t, some theta then place an order. Okay. So, now all I need to do is figure out what is the theta, right. but then if you look at the value function it, it looks like a very complex surface depending on the cross product space of how, how many items are left of each type. So, representing the value function becomes a harder problem and representing the policy directly is much easier. So, people looked at uh, direct uh, policy search methods because of that. The second thing is, uh, so uh, value function uh, approximation methods like I discussed just now do not have uh, good uh, convergence properties except under uh, very simple cases. Even though they work well in practice, but convergence results are hard to show, but then uh, policy parameterization methods actually have uh, strong convergence results. I mean they, they are known to converge to uh, local optima in the search space and uh, so on and so forth. Right. And the third thing which I did not touch upon so far is the problem of partial observability. So, so far we have been assuming that you, you know what the state is. Right. I say you look at the environment you find the state and you act according to that. Right. In many real problems you are not able to find the state. Right. For example, we have been saying that in backgammon or tic tac toe or 
something you, the state is fully observable to you. You just need to look at the board. That is not really true. You need to look into the mind of your opponent. Right? And just we have so far we have been implicitly assuming that the opponent is a fixed opponent who is playing the standard strategy and you do not have to really worry about the mental state of the opponent. But in reality when you are playing a game you have to worry about the mental state of the opponent. You cannot observe that. Or when you talk about real robots, so obviously the robot is not able to sense the entire world around it. It only has a few sensors, sonars and so on and so forth which tells you about the world and therefore the world is typically partially observable. Okay, you do not have full information about it. And empirically it has been observed that uh, policy approximation methods perform better when uh, there is this kind of partial observability, uh, marginally better than value function based methods. Right. So, that is some of the reasons why people look at the policy search methods. And there are uh, two classes of approaches here. So, one is a direct policy search, right? And the very popular way of doing it is using genetic algorithms. So, you have some kind of a representation of the policy, and then uh, you mutate that, you cross over that with another uh, version of the policy, and then you evaluate that, and that is your fitness function, and then you evolve these policies over multiple generations, blah, 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 right? And a more systematic way of doing it is something called uh, the policy gradient methods, where uh, you have this parameterization of the policy you find out the gradient of the performance with respect to these parameters and then move in the direction of the gradient not opposite right you do gradient ascent right so so how is this going to work out so i'm the policy depends on some kind of uh, parameters theta so theta could be uh, action preferences right uh, it could be weights of a neural network could be could be variety of different things and uh, so you are going to modify these policy parameters instead of estimating action values uh, here is a simpler version of what a performance measure would look like. Uh, let us assume that for the time being that we are in a simple problem setting where there are no states. Okay. So, you have a single state and we only have to pick out what is the best action to take in that state. Okay. So, we will extend it in a minute. Right. Uh, so, the, the estimate of your performance would be okay, Q star is the best possible action that you can take and uh, given that uh, you are selecting actions according to pi which is parameterized by theta. So, overall performance would be Q star of A into the probability of taking A, okay. right. And I can compute the gradient of uh, this with respect to theta, right. And uh, so, Q star does not depend on that. So, basically, I have to take the gradient of that, right. So, now I am going to do a little bit of a trick, right. Uh, so, that I can produce a quantity, okay, which is an expectation according to my current policy pi. So, if you look at this quantity, so I basically I have made the gradient as the expectation of this quantity right according to pi. Does that make sense? Right. What I have written out here is essentially the, is the, the expression for an expectation. Right. It is expectation of this quantity according to the distribution pi. Right. Now, now I can estimate this expectation by drawing samples because I, I have access to this policy pi. So, I can behave according to this policy pi, draw samples okay, and then form this expectation and that gives me the gradient. Right. So, that is basically what my, uh, it is just there is a couple of typos here, I am missing an eta here. So, that is gradient of eta right? and so I can form an estimate and that is basically it. Right. This is sometimes called the likelihood ratio. So, you can think of this as uh, the derivative of the logarithm of pi, right. So, so you now we can have complex pi, right, which involves a lot of products and other things. Then take the logarithm, right. Then become simple, uh, much simpler expression. Then you can take the derivative. So, I'm not going to work out any examples here, but uh, if people are interested, I can give you some examples of complex policy parameterization, which become which turn into easy update rules, right. So, in 92 uh, this person uh, Williams uh, proposed this algorithm called reinforce uh, which is one of the earliest uh, uh, neural network based RL algorithms uh, which essentially use the same uh, kind of uh, derivation that I wrote down for coming up with, uh, with an update rule. So, this is this version instead of doing the summation over n samples I am doing it in a fully incremental fashion. So, each for every sample I every time I take an action I go and update my thetas. Okay, so, that is essentially what I am doing here and uh, yeah like I said you can treat it as the derivative of the logarithm of the policy 
right. So, the full reinforce update according to Williams is given by this expression, where he had an arbitrarily introduced quantity called baseline, okay, which, which tells you what is the reward that you are going to get, okay, if you are behaving according to the policy pi. Okay, and then, so essentially it allows you to figure out whether your current action is better than average or worse than average. So, then he just introduced the baseline, it basically plunked it in arbitrarily and then showed that it does not affect the convergence behavior of the algorithm. Okay. And uh, the motivation for that was to be able to figure out if the rewards that you are receiving is it better than average or worse than average, because you do not know what a good reward is. Right. In fact, we looked at examples of problem where all the rewards are minus ones and then there is one reward of minus 100. Right. So, this, so the, now when, when as soon as you say there is a minus 100, then the minus 1 starts looking better. Right. So, you do not know which is good just by looking at absolute value. So, you basically have to have a baseline to compare it again. So, that is the motivation for adding this. And then this term, which is the derivative of ln pi, he called the characteristic eligibility. And uh, this reinforce is actually seeing a big revival now, uh, because um, uh, a lot of the deep learning community, not the RL community people. So RL community guys are happy to do Q learning with deep networks. Okay, the deep learning community people are happy to do reinforce with deep networks. So, there are two groups of people doing deep RL. So, one, one group which does reinforce and the other group which is doing uh, uh, Q learning. Right. So, so, how do you extend this to the full reinforcement learning problem? So, here your samples are I take an action, I get a reward okay, and then I go and update my parameters. Instead of that, if you want to look at the full reinforcement learning problem, instead of taking an action, I am going to say you have to take a whole trajectory. So, your samples are no longer actions, your samples are entire trajectories in the state space. Right. So, what if you do not have uh, uh, episodic tasks, then you just pick an arbitrary st state, you are saying then say that your trajectories are defined as returns to that state, you start from the state, you, you keep behaving and when you come back to the state, you say okay, that is the trajectory, I cut it there. So, that you get basically you get samples which are whole trajectories right and then uh, your criterion instead of the reward you had earlier now i'm going to use the return along this tra trajectory i just add up all the rewards i get along this trajectory i use that as my uh, evaluation measure right and uh, the the gradient of this thing here which is essentially the probability of seeing this return when i start from state s not right so earlier when i said uh, when we had uh, pi there, right. That is essentially the probability of picking action A, right. When I pick action A, then I am going to get Q star A. So, here I am going to say the problem. So, picking action A, I am going to say what is the probability of picking that entire trajectory, right. So, that is the generalization from the one step case that we saw to the full, full problem. And uh, it turns out that uh, with a little bit of uh, algebra, you can show that uh, this expression Okay, reduces to the summation over the individual ratio likelihood ratios of the actions along the trajectory. Okay, it's 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 fairly straightforward, um, right? Uh, the main problem here, though, is this uh, whole estimate depends on the starting state S not. Right. So this is, if you remember, this this is the, this is the, uh, the performance measure for the policy as a whole, but it depends on where you start the state right. So, one way of uh, getting around that uh, starting state assumption is to assume that uh, we have a fixed initial state right. If you are playing games that is not a problem right? you always have a fixed initial state, but in other cases it may a, may be a problem. There are ways of getting around that and one popular technique which I am not going to talk about unfortunately in this is to use what is known as average reward uh, which is the per time step reward and you can show that uh, for uh, finite MDPs and, uh, and under certain conditions that this is actually independent of where you start, um, right, but uh, we are not getting there, uh, right. So, here is a simple uh, way of doing this. So, this is a uh, eligibility trace, where I am going to essentially keep track of this summation, right, in an incremental fashion. And then here I am keeping track of the rewards, again I am doing this in incremental fashion. I can put all of this together and define a whole algorithm. Okay, which is essentially a policy gradient algorithm. Right. This allows me to solve problems 
without actually referring uh, keeping a uh, value function estimate right and use a parameterized representation for the policy right and uh, this can scale well provided uh, you come up with a mechanism for generating good samples. So, what is the problem here? Um, see the, the 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 estimate of the gradient that the policy gradient method is using is a completely unbiased estimate ok. And if the horizon of your episodes is very large the length of the episodes are very very large ok the, the variance in the estimate can become very very large because the bias is 0 right the variance can become very very large ok. And uh, so, this can lead to very slow convergence. So, if you can come up with mechanisms that uh, either uh, cut down on the recurrence time or introduce a bias into the estimate of the gradient right. So, that allows you to uh, be more efficient then you can come up with uh, very efficient algorithms overall that allows converge faster and can work on very large state spaces right. Um, so, what are the kinds of uh, things that people do? So, one thing which is kind of a heuristic is to truncate the eligibility traces. So, if you, if you remember the summation of z t. So, I will just stop it at some point or I can decay the summation of z t. So, that uh, the eligibilities do not run for too long. So, that will automatically reduce the variance uh, that I am having. And uh, the other class of uh, methods is to use which, which makes the gradient biased uh, is to do look at this actor critic methods. Uh, in actor critic methods you have both a value function estimate and a policy parameterization that is explicitly maintained. Right. So, in fact a lot of the, uh, the neuroscience community people prefer this kind of a mechanism where there is an explicit value function and a, a policy parameterization uh, separately maintained because it uh, apparently is more biologically plausible than talking about Q learning and saying that there is a max network uh, that runs over all the actions and then tries to pick the max. Uh, and uh, so, essentially what we do here is that when you are trying to estimate the return that you are going to get under a certain policy you kind of bootstrap that using the Q values that you are maintaining. You do not wait for the entire sample right. So, you do not just sample the return along the trajectory, but you use the Q values that you are estimating to kind of give you a uh, shortcut to getting those samples. What do you mean by convergence of samples? Yes, so that is always true right any of these learning algorithms all of these are data driven. So, the the how well you are going to perform depends on the quality of the samples that you are getting right. So, now we have moved to some kind of regression uh, domain all of these. So, here now your convergence is going to depend very highly on the quality of the samples that you have right if the variance is very high right if the variance of each of those updates that you are making is going to be very high then uh, convergence could naturally be very slow. Sometimes it might not happen at all. So, there is in fact if the if the horizon time in the episodes right or the recurrence time is very large convergence would not happen it will diverge. Um, anyway, so in actor critic methods essentially you use the value function and because the value function is an average estimate over many many runs ok. So, uh, uh, the variance would be low. So, if you are just uh, instead of taking individual samples uh, you can take the raise. And these are different methods for uh, looking at uh, variance reduction and again lot of work is going on um, and to confound us all. Uh, so, people who work with neural networks get these things to work regardless of what we say about uh, uh, variance and uh, lack of convergence and etcetera somehow these things work. So, we need to figure out how to get this to work right. And the other way of using parameterization is to look at uh, model parameterization and here we typically learn with uh, offline data or batch data you know I generate a bunch of trajectories ok and then I do a lot of computation with that batch of trajectories ok. And then I go back and I could possibly generate another batch or if it is offline I can just stay with that batch and do what is the best I can right. And uh, so, there are different me the methods some of them explicitly construct a model and work with it right. Some of them implicitly construct a model in terms of the updates that they are doing right. And so, linear dyna is a method that falls under the explicit construction 
uh, method right and uh, least squares td or fitted key iteration or methods that uh, actually construct the model implicitly right uh, but then um, uh, in, in fact they have pretty good uh, performance in practice uh, and uh, in uh, my group we have found that uh, fitted key iteration works really well when you are actually doing some kind of batch mode oral and um, and you can also uh, alternate actual experience uh, and learning with models you know you can do the normal q learning updates and other things and uh, then interleave that with uh, model based updates model based updates could be something like dynamic programming right so you could do something like dynamic programming and then interleave that with going and learning on a sample based uh, method and those things work uh, well as well right so so i'm going to kind of leave the uh, uh, parameterized uh, representations at this right and then move on to uh, learning with hierarchies uh, so here is a very popular uh, toy domain that people use in reinforcement learning it's called the taxi domain right uh, so there is apparently there should be a taxi somewhere here it's missing um, which is going around uh, picking up passengers from uh, different pick up and drop off points so whenever there is a demand uh, let's say the thing the way it operates is say somebody appears at r and says hey i want to be picked up the taxi goes there picks them up and then the person says i want to be dropped at b and then the taxi navigates to b drop them off and then now it's ready for another pickup right so whenever the taxi tries to pick up a passenger from any of the locations other than r g b and y it gets a negative reward whenever the taxi tries to drop off a passenger at a location other than where he or she wants to go it gets a negative reward right and for every step it moves along the way it gets a negative reward so essentially it basically has to do everything at the shortest time possible so that it gets the uh, maximum reward right so you can think of this as as a single mdp that you are trying to solve alternatively you can also think of this as a bunch of sub problems that are arranged in some kind of a hierarchy so for example so here's a root problem okay solve the world right and then here the f to there this essentially it's a repetition of these two tasks again and again so i have to get a passenger i have to put put the passenger where they want to go so get the passenger put the passenger somewhere so now i can think of okay what does get the passenger mean so get the passenger means well navigate to where the passenger is okay and pick up the passenger and what does put the passenger mean well navigate to where the passenger wants to go right and then put down the passenger right so this essentially now i'm breaking it up to simpler simpler sub tasks right now what does navigate mean well i wherever i am right use these four actions north south east west and go to the destination that is given to you right so now why is this a simpler problem when i'm solving this problem i don't have to worry about whether the passenger is in my car or passenger is outside the car right i don't have to worry about where the passenger wants to go right all i need to do is okay i have the xy coordinates of the car right now and i have the xy coordinates where i want to go just go there I don't have to worry about the whole bunch of other things. Right? Basically, it just reduces to just navigating in the grid world. The original problem that we saw earlier, right? A very simple grid world problem. It just reduced to that. So this has now become a much simpler problem to solve. And if you think about it, once I solve this problem, right? Figuring out when to do the pickup and when to do the put down becomes a lot easier. Right? At that point, I don't have to worry about any navigation problem. I just need to do a match between my x y coordinates. and where the passenger is my x y coordinates and where the passenger wants to go so i basically just have to match those and if they match then i can execute the action so now the problem has become much simpler so not only have i broken down the the temporal aspects of the problem what action i have to do after what i have also broken down the spatial aspects of the problem right when i'm doing navigate i only need the x and y coordinate right so when i do pick up i just need to know where the passenger is i don't need to know where the passenger wants to go when you do drop off i only need to know where the passenger wants to go because passenger should be in the car right so if the passenger is not in the car then there is no point i, I shouldn't be even trying to do the put down task right so these are the things so, so i'm also simplifying the representation so this whole idea behind hierarchical reinforcement learning so you not only break down your uh, Uh, uh control problem into simpler problems but you also break down the representation okay so there are many many ways in which uh, many many frameworks that people have proposed 
so the popular ones are options max q ham there is a very simple one that came uh, earlier called airports. So, essentially all of these uh, frameworks let the agent learn some skills right uh, like so navigate is a skill right. So, pick up and put down is a skill. So, it learns allows the agent to learn some skills and reuse them repeatedly to solve problems. So, that is the basic idea behind all of these right. So, let us quickly look at uh, the options framework right. Options framework is uh, in some sense fundamentally it is just a generalization of an action right. So, if you think about it an action can be started in some state in the MDP right. Then it does it executes a, a small piece of a policy which essentially do that action right. let us say go north right. So, I can start it somewhere and I can just execute go north and then I will stop. So, instead of that think of an action that says hey do not go north go 5 steps north. Right. So, I will start it from somewhere and then I will just execute a policy this which is essentially 5 north actions and then I will stop right. Now, I can start making this more complex I can say instead of go 5 steps north I can say hey go pick up a passenger ok that is my action or leave this room right that is my action right or go to the airport right. So, now that is a really complex action right and uh, well given it is Bangalore that certainly takes a lot of time to complete right. So, so, so these kinds of uh, flexibility is essentially what the options framework allows us. So, the option um, technically consists of a triple ok. So, I is the set of states in which the option may be started right in actions we really had never thought about it, but in options you will have to think about it right. So, when you say put down a passenger as an option then it can be only started in states where the passenger is in the car and uh, pi is the policy that has to be followed during the options execution right and beta is the probability of terminating in each state. It could you can make it deterministic you can say if beta is 1 then you stop if beta is 0 you do not stop. So, it can make it like an indicator function. So, that then it will become the set of states in which the option can terminate, but sometimes it is convenient to have the termination condition as uh, being stochastic. So, the definition allows for that right. So, so in for example, in this case you can think of uh, multiple options being defined and uh, you can say ok all the from all the states in this room I define one option that will take me to this doorway right this is a useful thing to know right. So, because I can start defining navigation here as go from room 1 to room 2 right go from room 2 to room 3 and then you can find your destination in room 3. Suppose, I am looking for some say telephone you can say hey from here go go to that room and then uh, there will be a telephone in that room you can call right. So, this is how you think right how this how you break down complex policies. So, you do not tell me that ok climb up this each one of the step push the door open right. So, you just say go to the other room and then there will be this. So, likewise you can start thinking of breaking down this along maybe along the structure of the problem domain right. Well, I mean it makes sense if I say I leave this room from room 1 go to room 2 it makes sense to assume that you can start in room 1 right outside of room 1 does not make sense yeah it could I mean it is up to you to define things however whichever way it is useful to you right I am just telling you what the framework allows you to do in case of leave a room option it will be useful to define it as any box in the room right. So, uh, the because now I have introduced actions that actually have duration to complete right earlier we are not worrying about the duration if you remember some time back looks like ages ago I said that your time steps 1 2 3 do not correspond to real time steps. So, 1 could be 3 seconds 2 could be 5 milliseconds and so on and so forth right. So, but we never worried about that, but now I am explicitly introducing actions that take different amounts of time right and therefore, the appropriate model for this is something known as semi Markov processes semi Markov decision process not not the MDPs this is generalization of MDPs where the actions are durative right. And uh, there are generalizations of uh, Q learning T D learning and SARSA and other, other things all, all that we have looked at so far which work with semi Markov process ok. So, you can use those variants to learn with options so, that is nice thing about options most of the other learning algorithms actually have their own I am um, sorry most of the other uh, hierarchical uh, architectures come come with their own learning algorithms 
right. So, hams have ham q learning and uh, max has max q q learning and things like that and uh, but then options it is fairly straightforward right. But then there is a big question where do these options come from. So, what are useful options you know and uh, there are many ways in which people have defined uh, 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 I mean options. So, more often than not right it turns out that uh, you, you, you try to find some notion of what is a bottleneck right doorways or bottlenecks. So, why is that sorry doorways or bottlenecks because when I want to move from here to anywhere here I have to pass through this one state you know. So, these are like access states when I when I move through the state I have access to a lot of other states in the world right. So, so geometrically it looks like a bottleneck right. So, these are these kinds of states are called bottleneck states they need not necessarily be geometric like physical bottlenecks like a doorway. So, it could be that I have to pick up an object I have to pick up a key. So, that I can open this door and leave right. So, that is picking up the key could be a access access state not necessarily the passing through the door right. So, uh, people have looked at different kinds of uh, different ways of uh, figuring out what the bottlenecks are. So, there is this work uh, McGovern and Barto and a couple of other extension where people just looks at look at trajectories through the state space right and basically count the number of times each state is hit in the trajectory and uh, states that are hit on many many different trajectories and on successful trajectories are identified as bottlenecks right. And then there is this is other work uh, using graph partitions uh, where uh, you, you assume that you have access to the uh, transition model. Okay, and then uh, treat that as a connectivity adjacency graph between states right. If you can if you have an action that takes you from one state to another then assume that it is connected in a graph right and then try to do partitions on that right. If you think of the room world example you are going to get a, a well connected grid components like four components that are like grid like and then there will be one or two states one or two nodes that are connected between the grids. So, when you try to do cuts on that graph you can naturally see that those uh, doorways will be the ones that are cut right. So, you could uh, think of doing something like that and then uh, there is notion of betweenness from social networks uh, they look at shortest paths between nodes and if a uh, lot of shortest paths pass through a node then you say that the node has a high betweenness. If we think of again let us go back to the rooms well. So, I go from room 1 to room 2 if I take any source node in room 1 and a destination node in room 2 the shortest path between them has to pass through the doorway right. So, that then that doorway becomes state of high betweenness and then you can cut it there right. So, all, all, all the states with high betweenness uh, would be um, places where you want your options to take you right. Likewise there are many ways in which uh, you can look at it and so, I will try to talk about meta stability in the next 5 minutes I do not know how much I can get to. This is something which we have been working with and uh, it gives you very robust options and uh, we have done some cool stuff with it and uh, let us see how much I get through. Did we start really late because uh, my timer says I have been talking only for 44 minutes. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So, basic motivation is going to find regions of the state space that are well connected right and then try to abstract them away as a single state right. So, essentially now what happens is I have this four rooms that are well connected I am going to say hey each room is a separate state I have room 1, room 2, room 3, room 4 and then there is connectivity between them right. So, that is essentially what I am going to try and find and uh, so we are uh, and then when you want to define options they are basically transitions between these abstract states right. So, we are going to use this notion from um, physics right from a field of physics called conformal dynamics uh, where they talk about meta stability right. So, meta stability is a state of the system in which the system can stay for an indefinite amount of time as long as there is no external input, but with probability 1 it will eventually leave that state. So, it is not a truly stable state it, a truly stable state is it will stay there for forever unless there is a external disturbance or external energy input right. Uh, but a meta stable state is something it will leave after a while, okay, but it could stay there for a long time right. Now, if you think of walking around randomly in a room right, 
just walking around randomly in the room, with a very high probability you will only stay in the room. You really have to stumble on a doorway and when you are next to the doorway, you have to pick the right action to exit the door, through the door for you to leave the room. So, so if I am just walking around randomly, I will be staying in the room for a very, very long time. Okay, so, you can think of these kinds of things as metastable uh, regions and so essentially we are going to try and find these metastable regions. Right? I am going to skip this a little. Uh, Suffice it to say that we have a clustering algorithm okay, uh, that not only gives us uh, clusters uh, in a very deterministic fashion like unlike k-means right. So, whenever I run this algorithm I will get the same clusters. Uh, not only it gives them uh, clusters in a deterministic fashion it also allows me a very systematic way of assigning memberships right. So, this whole thing I mean I can talk about the clustering algorithm for an hour. So, let me skip that. Um, so, it also gives me a way of a nice way of determining membership to these clusters. So, what we are doing is assuming that is the clustering algorithm which I am skipping right. So, now I can run the clustering algorithm this is a kind of a room or room world domain gone slightly crazy. So, there are 14 rooms and then they are connected by some maze of doorways and uh, when I run our algorithm on it, it finds most of the rooms. Some of the long rooms get split into two, but it, it gets gets most of those right. And some of the other uh, spectral clustering methods that we tried, they fail miserably on this, right. Uh, so, here is what is happening. So, you remember I told you that we have a membership function, right. The membership function is going to start looking like this. So, here is a world which is a room within a room, right. So, I am going to for every cluster that I am going to find, I will have a membership function. So, how much does the state belong to that cluster? And it turns out that for the outer room, I am going to get a membership function that looks like this. And for the inner room, I get a membership function that looks like that. So, I very neatly separates the outer room and the inner room, right. Now, I can say that all these states for which the inner room has a higher membership go into one abstract region. All the states where the outer room membership is high go into another region. So, not only this, right. So, you can see that there is actually a dip in these functions. Right? They tell me where the doorway is, right. So, if I want to go from the inner room to the outer room, all I need to do is follow the gradient of this membership function and I can just say okay, I want to go to the outer room I start from here and then walk in the direction of decreasing membership or walk in the direction of increasing membership to the outer room and I will be out right. So, it not only tells me where are the, uh, the connecting points it tells me how to get there also basically it gives me the option it gives me the i right. So, i is given by the membership function, it gives me the pi, it is given by the gradient of the membership function, it gives me the beta, beta is essentially all those points where the, the transitions happen right. So, I can use these, these points to actually define beta. So, it gives all of this thing in one go. So, basically I run clustering I get i pi and beta. So, none of the other methods I spoke about have this kind of a uh, facility. So, you actually have once you find where the option is supposed to take you. So, you have to run another routine to figure out what i pi and beta should be right. So, like I was mentioning earlier, so it does not have to be like physical doorways or anything it could be more behavioral bottlenecks. So, here is a region where there is no obstacles or anything you just have to pick up an object right and when we run this clustering algorithm it uh, finds out that uh, holding object is uh, uh, one uh, abstract region not holding the object is another abstract region and this peak here in this, in this this dip here in this membership essentially tells you the transition. So, this is actually at 4 comma 15 in the in the in the space. So, it just tells you how you go and pick it up right and yeah. So, I already told spoke about this right uh, and uh, so, we can do lots of interesting stuff here. Right? So, so, so far we have been assuming that you have the full transition matrix available to you. So, that you can do the segmentation right that is what we needed to run uh, any kind of spectral clustering algorithm. So, you need that I, I said you can take the transition matrix convert that to a graph and then run segmentation on the graph. So, what if I did not have the transition matrix right. So, what we did was uh, we again did uh, some kind of sampling right. So, we start solving the problem assuming that you do not know anything about the world. So, initially you are behaving blindly basically randomly. So, in, in some sense you are doing a random walk because you have learnt nothing to begin with. So, you have no information about the world. So, essentially you are doing some kind of a random walk right. So, what happens is you gather all the transitions that you are seeing during the random walk. You make an estimate of the model of the world 
right? You make an estimate of the model of the world and then run segmentation on that estimated model. Okay. So how well does this work? Well, we do not have any, any results on uh, how, how well this is going to work, uh, but uh, empirically we found that it can actually solve really complex problems. Right? And uh, so, well, we did, we did some, some simple examples. So, here is a two room grid world. So, it is a very, very thin room, it is more like a corridor and here is a larger room and then the goal was placed randomly all over the uh, rooms uh, and then uh, so you can see the red line is basically our uh, learning algorithm. So, it figured out uh, just two options one was go from this room to this room other one was go from this room to that room and uh, you can see that it uh, is optimal almost from the beginning. So, as soon as the options were discovered here right in the, in the first few episodes we managed to discover the options and after that. Uh, it's it's uh, behaving much better than the other uh, uh, benchmarks we consider. So essentially, what did we uh, the baselines we considered were a bias to move in a particular direction. So I was telling you that you could define options that say go north five steps, right, or go east four steps. So like that. So we had options that instead of taking you one step at a time, it could take you very far. So the law allows you to explore the state space quickly. So that's the reason behind that. And we also used a graph cut based approach which is kind of at that point when we ran the experiments it was the best option discovery thing that was there empirically and uh, we could beat uh, L cut. L cut actually does do well at the end, but it uh, finds a lot more options than necessary it ends up finding less than 12 options. Yeah. I am sorry I did not get what you said. So, we, we have done some experiments where uh, we, uh, we did this in a time equalized fashion right and uh, so we are certainly better than doing some things like Q learning right uh, plain vanilla Q without, without doing any option discovery right because even while we are learning those initial uh, trajectories right even when we are doing the initial trajectories we are learning it is not like we are behaving randomly completely. So, it is essentially Q learning at the beginning and then as and when you start discovering useful options you get better and better at it right. So, in that sense it is it is fine it works well, but I can talk to you about some of the other uh, time equalized experiments that we have been running there are some really interesting results that we have with randomly generated options okay <laughs> which 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 actually do well. I am not talking about that here because it is kind of self defeating in this case, but uh, so it uh, I can talk to you about that offline yeah. right and here in the taxi domain we ran this and again uh, so we found about 20 options and what was interesting about these options that we found we did not give it that initial tree structure I was using for illustrating hierarchies right. So, it just it was just learning from scratch, but then it learned many of these options it learned where uh, very similar to pick up right. So, it actually learnt pick up at r pick up at y right. So, each one of those destinations. So, it learnt four pick up options it learnt four put down options. So, for each one of those locations and not only that it uh, the, the remaining uh, 12 options were some kind of pairwise navigate options you know. So, navigate from close to r to close to b So I navigate from close to y to close to r. So, those kinds of options it is actually it is very nice the way the options it discovered were both all the put out put, I mean put down and pick up options and as well as a, a subset of the navigate options it learnt that. And uh, of course, we can do some more fine parameter tuning to figure out uh, the right set of options, but we did not do any careful tuning of parameters here. So, we just used the same uh, heuristic for picking the number of options run it across all the domains which is essentially used an eigen gap uh, heuristic. So, it uh, that is interesting. And uh, we then did it on the Mario domain how people have played this Mario thing you have to run across the screen pick up coins kill monsters and so on so forth. And that is possibly the largest domain that has been used so far for option discovery. Uh, in fact, taxi is, is largest than any other paper has reported so far, but uh, some of the reviewers did not think so. So, we actually ran it on the Mario domain technically there are uh, 25 raised to the power of 352 states in the domain. Uh, but only about 20,000 states are ever visited during gameplay. So, 
but you have to account for the fact that your state space is that large. So, so some kind of sparse representation is needed. So, we used uh, different kinds of parameterized value functions. So, one is a kind of a aggregation state aggregation based uh, measure called CMAC and we also use deep auto encoders for representing the value function. And this whole uh, transition matrix the samples for trajectories and other things that we are doing are only in that phi of s space we did not look at the s space right. Once we use parameterization we get this phi s vector right. So, the transitions were defined only on the phi s not on the s itself and then we did segmentation on this right and try to learn options right and uh, surprisingly it did well right. And so, it gets uh, rewards for achieving side goals such as gathering coins or killing monsters and other things. So, so this is the, the cumulative number of side goals that the agent achieves as the learning progresses. So, you can see that uh, the Q learning agent raw Q learning agent learns to play the game it learns successfully to run from left to right right, but uh, it does not know how to kill monsters or gather coins or anything it just learns to survive and reach the right edge of the screen. Uh, while the agent that is learning options learns very quickly to uh, policies to uh, complete the side goals and uh, does really well. And uh, you can see some of the options it discovers or whenever it sees coins on the screen it jumps up uh, gathers those coins and uh, in fact, it repeatedly jumps up sometimes it misses the coin. So, it can go up up and down and try to gather the coin all the time and then uh, it speeds up to jump over a pit. So, it, it learns it as a single action. So, as soon as it sees a pit somewhere it starts running faster and then jumps over that is a single action it does not have to make decisions in between right. And uh, other interesting thing it learnt is uh, there are different kinds of monsters in Mario if people have played it and there is a turtle ok. So, when you kill the turtle it is not dead right when you jump on the turtle the shell is still alive. So, you have to jump and then immediately kick the shell away otherwise the shell can kill you right. So, it learns that as a single option it jumps on the shell and kicks it away because otherwise quite often the episode ends there right. So, these are nice things it learnt some are pretty inexpli inexplicable. I mean I have some videos, but I am not going to show this to you because whenever there is a pillar on the left side of the screen and coins on the right side of the screen it just goes crazy ok. It just keeps jumping up and down in the middle of the screen forever ok and until a random exploration pulls it away. So, so these are some kind of inexplicable options it learns I am pretty sure it is because of the parameterization that we are using, uh, but then it does really well right. So, future we are trying to do some experiments with Atari games now trying to find options with Atari games we want to look at uh, extending to state and action spaces. And uh, we are looking at um, you know many of this uh, like the rooms world domain and things like that they are very symmetric you know you can rotate the room slightly and then you can still recover the policy that you want to use and so on and so forth we are trying to see how we can use symmetries and uh, and bunch of other things which I did not talk much about. So, I cannot really explain here. Uh, so, here is the conclusion for the whole thing not just for this talk uh, for both the talks together. So, a lot of excitement in the community now right and uh, especially scaling right. So, lots of interesting uh, experiments that are coming. So, there are a uh, lot of work on learning from demonstrations how we can learn from a human. So, you can cut down on the initial random exploration that I was telling you you can cut the cut down on that by asking a human to do something and then trying to learn by imitation of that right and uh, so there are many many advances in model based reinforcement learning which I did not talk about today. And of course, deep RL is uh, being uh, pursued very actively by different groups of people from different uh, disciplines right. But uh, I did say that deep Q network on the Atari games is reproducible, but it is reproducible on the Atari games right. So, we need we need more work in uh, to get uh, off the shelf RL algorithms like you have off the shelf SVM solvers and things like that. So, you need to more work to get off the shelf algorithms, but the sense is that we are getting closer than before. And in fact, there was a period of time when at least personally I felt that we are not making much progress towards that, <laughs> but uh, I think in the last few years uh, certainly lots of uh, interesting activities. So, <coughs> start working in RL. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Ravindran again for uh, uh, giving a couple of very illuminating lectures on reinforcement learning. This is a memento for you.